Okay, folks, we're going to go through this one quite quickly then. The first 10 questions. So, this is November 2017, paper one. Let me get these uh, 15 minutes. So, big one, turn it over. We've got our periodic table in handy, so let's keep that safe. <coughs> Calculations first. Question one How many atoms of nitrogen are there in 0.5 moles of ammonium carbonate? So, atoms, are we going to be needing the Avogadro constant? 6.02 times 10 to the 23. But how many? No. There's 0.5 moles of this stuff, but how many nitrogens are in the formula? There's two of them, because it's NH42. So there's two nitrogens. So your moles of nitrogen would be 2 times 0.5, which is uh, 1. So how many atoms are there then? Well, it's basically Avogadro's constant, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 times the number of moles, which is 1. So 1 times that is D. Okay, so you've got... Uh, a mole of nitrogen atoms. Which solution neutralizes 50 centimeters cubed or 0.12 mole per decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide? We've got various acids here. We've got a triprotic, two monoprotics, and a diprotic. So there's the volume and the concentration. So let's look at the monoprotic ones because they're an easy comparison, first of all. So with the monoprotic one, I'd need one of those to react with one of those. We've got the same concentration, 0.12 to 0.12. However, I've got half the volume. So if I add half the volume, I'm not going to neutralize the sodium hydroxide because the way they react will be CH3COOH plus sodium hydroxide gives us sodium ethanoate plus H2O. It's a neutralization, so there's not enough of that. So it's not this one. What about the nitric acid? Well, that would be nitric acid would react with sodium hydroxide to give me sodium nitrate plus water. So I've got the same volume, but I've got half the concentration. So there's not enough nitric acid to neutralize all the sodium hydroxide. So it's not going to be this one. What about the sulfuric acid? This looks like a fairly straightforward one. I've got the same concentration. This is a diprotic acid. So H2SO4 would react with two sodium hydroxides to give me uh, sodium sulfate plus a couple of waters. Now I've got the same concentration. I've got half the volume of sulfuric acid, but if you notice the way they react is a 1 to 2 ratio. So if I've got half the volume but the same concentration, I have half the number of moles of sulfuric acid compared to sodium hydroxide, but that's just the right ratio that I need. So this one will work nicely. So I'm looking at that one. This one's a bit of a, a sort of a tricky one. I've got two-thirds of the concentration, and I've got a quarter of the volume there. Now, the way they react is H3PO4 causes triprotics. That could react with free sodium hydroxides, and that would give us sodium phosphate plus free waters. But what I kind of see already, I'm not going to sort of go to the trouble of working this through because I'm already confident with this one. Again, I've eaten into precious time in the exam. The concentration is lower than here, and the volume is lower than here. Okay, now if the concentration was the same, if it was 0.12, I've still only got a quarter, and a quarter wouldn't quite cut it, because I would need at least one third of the volume if I had the same concentration. So even if I had 0.12, I don't have enough volume to neutralize all the sodium hydroxide. So it's not this one based on that. I'm going to go with C. Okay. Next one down the beneath then, what is the pressure in PA pascals inside a 1 meter cubed cylinder containing 10 kilograms of hydrogen at 25 degrees C? Nice to see that it gives us the ideal gas equation because of course we don't have the data booklet. It also gives us the value for the gas constant, 8.31. So rearranging to find pressure, well pressure equals uh, NRT divided by V. So we know what R is, it's 8.31. We know what temperature is in Kelvin. We've just got to add 273 to that, so that would be 298 Kelvin. We need to know the number of moles of hydrogen. So the number of moles of hydrogen is 10 kilos, so that's 10,000 grams, divided by the relative formula mass of hydrogen using our periodic table, so that's 2 times 1, basically. So divided by 2, so that comes to 5,000. So we've got 5,000 times 8.31 times 298, and that's going to be divided by the volume in meters cubed, which is 1. So which is the best match for that one? Uh, well, it looks like this one, where we've got 5 times 10 to the 3, which is uh, the same as 1,000. So that's the one I want to be going with. Just to eliminate some of the rest of them, 5 times 10 to the 2, well, that's not going to be enough. That would only be 500, so it's not that one. Uh, this one... Who knows what they've got going on there. They've got 1 times 10 to the 4. I don't know where they've pulled that from. 
and then they've got 1 times 10 3. This one just looks a bit of nonsense included, and they haven't even converted into Kelvin, so that's just wrong on multiple levels. And then uh, this one down here, well, again, it's not in Kelvin. It's still divided by 1 times 10 to the 3. Uh, presumably they're doing... Well, yeah, who knows what they're trying to do there. It's all a bit... Uh, they're just playing around with the numbers like they don't know what they're doing, basically. But using it, that's how we apply it, and we get the right answer. So create my advice, create the equation for yourself, and then match it with the correct answer. Number four, a compound with MR102 contains 58.8% carbon, 9.8% hydrogen, 31% oxygen per mass. What is its molecular formula? Now, remember, we don't have a calculator. So we're not going to be getting precise values. We just need approximations. So the way we carry the empirical formula out is we create a column for each element, and then we take the mass or percentage, whatever we're given, Really, we need masses, but you can just pretend the percentage is a mass and it doesn't matter. We divide that by the relative atomic mass from the periodic table. So divide that by 12, divide that by 1, divide that by 16. And then that's near enough 60. Okay, so that's pretty close to 60. 60 divided by 12, that's about 5. Okay, so about 5. That's near enough 10. 10 divided by 1, approximately 10. 31, that's nearly 32. 32 divided by 16 is approximately 2. Okay. So which one matches up with that? C5H10O2. Well, that is here. Let's just check that gives the correct molecular uh, formula mass. So that'd be 5 times 12, and it should do, because you think, well, these add up to 100, and that's not far off 100, because we've basically kept the numbers. So 5 times 12 would be 60 plus 10 plus 32. That equals 102. So it's as simple as that. Okay, We don't need to do any more, anything more complicated than that. Five, what is the number of protons, the number of neutrons in uh, 131 iodine? So note says neutrons are not nucleons, so do be careful with that because nucleons are protons and neutrons. Uh, they're both nucleons. <clears throat> so look at our periodic table. Where's iodine? Here's iodine, smaller number, atomic number, 53. So it's 53 protons, so it's one of those two. How many neutrons? Well, 131 take away 53. Uh, well, that's not going to be 131, is it? It's going to be 78, and that about looks right. So... That is answer A. Because basically, yes, 131 take away 53. The graph represents the first 10 ionization NGs, i.e. of an element. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, big jump. Looks like we're in group 6 for this element because the first 6 were easy to remove and now we're starting a new shell. So oxygen's in group 6, but wait a minute. This is the IB. They're going to be crafty. There's not enough electrons for oxygen. Oxygen's only got atomic number 8 and we've removed 10 electrons. So oxygen, we would have had to stop here with eight electrons. So it's not oxygen. Sulfur is also in group six, and sulfur's got 16 electrons, because sulfur's got atomic number 16. So sulfur's looking good. Neon, well, no, because then it would have been eight electrons in a row, and then the ninth one being harder, because you consider it as group 18, which you can call group zero, or what used to be called, more helpfully, group eight. Chlorine, uh, that's in group 7, so it would have been 7 electrons in a row, and then the jump, so not that one, so we're looking at B. So you remove the first 6 electrons from the outer shell, and then you break it into the second shell, it requires more energy because it's closer to the nucleus. Number 7, which electron configuration is that of a transition metal in the ground state? Uh, well, what are they? This one here, that's neon 3s2, 3p6, 4s1, so here's neon. And then if we come along, there's 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. Well, it's not even a transition metal. Uh, it's uh, potassium, basically. That's potassium, so it's not that one. 3d9, well, you need at least some... If it's in a ground state, where sort of, um, and it's an atom, then we need at least some electrons in the 4s. There's no electrons in the 4s, so what this would correlate with would be copper 2+. plus. Because basically, if you remember a copper atom, copper 2 plus would be 4s1, 3d10. And then if it's lost two electrons, it would lose the 4s1 and then one from the 3d10 to be 3d9. So that's copper 2 plus, it's not that. This one, we're already across into 4p2. So we've gone past the transition metal. So we've gone 3d10 and then we're into 4p2. So this would actually be germanium. Uh, so there's your uh, two electrons in the 4p sublevel. So that's not it. It's germanium. So what about this one? Must be the right answer. Well, 4s1, 3d5. I know if you count along, you sort of think, oh, well, 3d5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, manganese. But it's not manganese because it's only 4s1. It's chromium. Remember, what chromium does is the little trick to get a full half sublevel. Rather than being 4s2, 3d4, it pops an electron from the s into the 
D sublevel to get a half full sublevel. So that's the one that is chromium. Okay, so that'll be D. Which trends are correct across period free from sodium to chloride? Atomic radius decreases. Yes, as nuclear charge increases, the electrons get pulled in more tightly. Uh, so atomic radius decreases because we don't start a new shell. Melting point increases. Well, it does at the start. It increases from sodium to magnesium to aluminium, if you remember. And then it jumps up massively for silicon. But then it comes crashing back down again for um, is it, uh, phosphorus. Up a little bit again for sulfur, down for chlorine, down for argon. So, so we certainly can't say the melting point increases, because it does for a bit, but then it comes crashing back down again. So not that one. And remember, because we're changing the type of structure, we're going from metallic bonding to a giant covalent lattice to simple molecules with weak intermolecular forces, apart from simple atoms in the case of argon. It only goes as far as chlorine, so yeah, it's right. Uh, first ionization energy increases, yes, it does, because as the nuclear charge increases, then it becomes harder to remove an electron from the outer shell. So we're looking at one and three only. Okay. That'll be the melting points. Which oxide dissolves in water to give a solution with a pH below seven? Well, you're looking for a non metal oxide. Metal oxides, if they dissolve, will give you a pH above seven. So magnesium oxide pretty much doesn't dissolve actually so it would make the solution a bit above seven uh, alkaline lithium hydroxide would be created here that would react to give lots of lithium hydroxide and that would give you a ph well above seven because you'd get lots of lithium hydroxide so ph will be uh, greater than seven calcium oxide similarly you'll get some calcium hydroxide again which has limited solubility but you'd get a ph above seven uh, so it's the non-metal oxide here that would give uh, phosphoric acid basically uh, which way is it? You'd get. Don't even remember the balance it now. I think it's P4O10, reacts with something like six waters, and then gives you uh, something like four H3PO4s. Is that balanced? 16, 6, 10, 12, 12, yeah. So. Yeah, and that's phosphoric acid, basically, so you'll have a pH below 7. So that's the one we want. And then the last one, number 10 then. So uh, the hexachloro uh, cobalt ion is orange, but the uh, hexaamine cobalt ion is yellow. Which statement is correct? Uh, this one absorbs orange light. Well, no, we'd, it must absorb a different color to orange, because remember, we're not seeing, we see the remaining colors which are not absorbed. So when we come to look at the complementary color wheel, opposite orange i think is blue light so basically it absorbs blue light and then the remaining colors which are not absorbed pass through and appear orange overall so it doesn't absorb orange because it appears orange okay We're, this is not absorbed so that's wrong in fact it would be blue light and then white light minus the blue light would appear orange uh, the oxidation state of cobalt is different in each complex uh, well it's not though is it because it's plus three in this one because the chlorides have a negative charge so if they're down at 3 minus the complex ion, they bring it down by 6 minus. So the fact it's only on 3 minus means the cobalt must be plus 3 as an oxidation state. And here, well, it's a neutral species, the amine, uh, ammonia. So if it's 3 plus overall, this has no charge, so it must be plus 3 as well there. So there's no difference in the oxidation state. Different colours are due to the different charges on the complex. Uh, no, I mean the different charges on the metal ion, if that was the case, could cause different colours. If there was one was cobalt 2 plus and cobalt 3 plus, but they're not, uh, so it's not that one. Uh, the different ligands cause different splitting in the d orbitals. So that's what we're looking for basically. It's the kind of fact that so like if you've got the d sublevel splits, and then what you've got an electron in the case of cobalt, if it's 3 plus, what would it be? Uh, You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It would have had seven, so now it's got six. So it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and then to pop an electron into there, uh, well, that difference in energy would be caused by the ligands. Okay, so uh, I haven't got the spectrochemical series on me, but I imagine ammonia probably causes a greater amount of splitting than uh, chloride, and that would affect this value here, this HV, when we then pop an electron into the higher energy level okay we promote an electron in what's known as a d to d transition so that specific frequency of light is absorbed and then different ligands 
affect the size of that split and, and therefore the different uh, a different frequency of light would be absorbed uh, so it's the size of the split in that causes the difference in color okay so that's the one we're after okay that's that first video done then folks